want to talk about our future hope. And actually, this kind of came about uh, several weeks ago. Nathan had sent me a, uh, a message that Charles Spurgeon did back in the 1860s, and it was on uh, the resurrection of the dead. And he was mentioning at that time how he had very few, he had never heard a sermon on it before, and he couldn't already find a book on it. And he uh, said the society at that time, one thing that was different then than now is the fact that most people believed that the uh, spirit, the soul, lived forever, but they didn't really believe or really comprehend that our bodies will be resurrected. Now, today it's a little different because I think most people, most atheists, would say, you know, when you... When you die, you just cease to exist. There is no spirit or soul that goes on. So it's a little, a little different time than what people believe. But what actually spurred this before, I had told Nathan even, that I'd been thinking about this for several weeks because I remember Rick Joyner uh, made a statement actually several different times. And he said, most Christians, his observation was that most Christians don't die well. Uh, and that really bothered me. And I got thinking about it. Well, why? Um, and that verse that first came to my mind was in Hebrews uh, chapter 2, verses 14 15. I'll just read that to you. Our main text is going to be out of 1 Corinthians 15, but I'm going to give some other verses before we get there. But let me just read that to you. Second or Second uh, Hebrews chapter two and verse fourteen and fifteen. It says, "This is talking about Jesus." It says, "Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil." And here's the key passage: "And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear." Of death. And so I think there's a disconnect within even the Christian community about our eternal hope. And so I want to go through some scriptures first. I'm going to give you the, the bad news first, and then we'll talk after that about the good news. So I'm going to go to Romans chapter 8 first. Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 25. This is Paul speaking. He says, I consider that our present suffering are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to frustration, not by his own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bodies of decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruit of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. So the key kind of phrase in that is that all creation will be liberated from its decay or corruption. In other words, not just our physical bodies, but all of creation is under this curse. We all age, we all die, all, you know, the longest living tree, however many hundred years that is that it lives, eventually it corrupts and it, and it decays and it dies. And so all of creation is groaning for something more. 
And yet, this is a fact of life that we live in a fallen world. And as a result of that fallen world, we ourselves, as is in all creation, decays. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I'm going to read a couple verses there. 16 through 18. And again, this is Paul speaking. He says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporal, but what is unseen is eternal. So in this first verse, it says, we do not lo- lose heart, though outwardly, outwardly we are wasting away. I don't know how many of you have ever kind of looked in the mirror and you go, who is that person? I don't remember me as that, this reflection, you know, I'm getting. And as you go on in chapter 5, he says, Now we know that if this earthly tent, and he uses that as an analogy, you know, this earthly earth suit, this body, things we call the physical body, we live in it if it is destroyed. We have a building from God that is eternal in heaven. Now it's not built by human hands. Now meanwhile we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, in other words in this body, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who's made us for this very purpose and given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith and not by sight. Now, we are confident, I say, that we would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due Him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. But Paul was able to say, I would prefer to be away from this body and to be with the Lord. He knew it was much better. And yet we sometimes really try to hang on to our physical life. Not realizing that we have something much greater that's in store for us. So if this earthly tent, this this physical body is destroyed, we have a hope of an eternal body. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. One last scripture before we get to 1 Corinthians 15. It's in 1 Peter, verse 24. And this is actually copied from, uh, or restated from Isaiah 40, verse 6 to 8. But it says, all men are like grass. Now, I've got to put women in there, too, because everybody goes, yeah, well, men, they're like grass. No, all humankind, in other words, all men are like grass. All their glory is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Now, it's not all bad news. I mean, there's some really cool things that happen. Like, I, I notice that I start growing <laughs> hair out of my ears and my nose and on my back. I mean, how great is that? 
But that is just a fact that we live in a fallen world, that we all eventually grow old, we decay. And I hate to bust your bubble, but it will happen to you. And that's why we need to put our, our focus upon the new body we're going to get. So let's go to our main topic, which is going to be 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Or, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, this is actually one of the longest chapters of, of all Paul's writing here. And I looked at several scholars who say this is actually probably the most important chapter in the Bible. And yet, it's something we, I've never heard really taught. I mean, we, we talk a lot about, uh, you know, the resurrection of Christ, but not very much about what happens to us, the resurrection of your body. So we're going to go through the chapter. And it says, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached you with. Otherwise, you have believed in faith. In vain, I'm sorry. For, I re for what I received, I passed on to you as a first importance. Well, this is pretty important. A first importance. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture. He was buried, and that he raised on the third day, according to the Scripture. And then he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers at the same time. Many who have, are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And back in, that, in verse 3, which says, I passed on to you what I have received if you go to Galatians, it talks about how Paul had received this. He didn't receive it from the other apostles. He received it from Jesus. So, Jesus preaching Jesus, it doesn't get any better than that. But in verse 7, then he said, He also appeared to James, you know, they're the half-brother of Jesus, who wasn't a believer originally. Then to all the apostles, and then to me he appeared to me also, as one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believe. Verse 12, But if, it's, if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how come some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? So obviously there is some false teaching going around that's saying, you will not be resurrected. Yes, Christ was resurrected, but you won't be resurrected. Verse 13, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we have found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who also have fallen asleep in Christ, he uses that falling asleep as another euphemism for death, in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. 
But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who've fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes to, through a man. For as in Adam all died, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn. Christ is the first fruit, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. Now the last enemy to be, to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under his feet, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Now if there is no resurrection, what will those who do baptize for the dead? So apparently at this time, there were some people who were baptizing for the, for the dead. There's nothing in Scripture that gives us, you know, any information about doing that, uh, positive or not. He's just making a statement that there were some people who are doing it. And it said, if they are not raised, why are people baptizing for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I die every day. I mean that, brothers, just as surely as I glory over you in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If I have fought with wild beasts in Ephesus for mere, merely human reasons, what have I gained if the dead are not raised? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we will die. So probably true, if if you really not, don't have any hope for the future, let us eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die. Do drugs, do alcohol, dull the pain, because there is no future. But we have a future. Verse 33, do not be misled. Bad companies or bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought. And stop sinning. For there are some of you who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. Verse 35. But someone may ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. When you sow, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives it his own body. All flesh is not the same. Men have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. Now there are heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is of one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon has another, and the stars another. And stars differ from star in splendor. So it will be at the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, and it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. So if there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam meaning Christ, a living, giving spirit. 
The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man is from heaven. As were the earthly man, so are those who are the earth. And as is the man from heaven, so also are those who are, are of heaven. And just as we bore the likeness of the earthly man, so we shall bear the likeness of the man of heaven. Think about that. You know, after Christ was risen, he shows up in the room. Disciples have the door locked, and all of a sudden, he's there. Can come, walk through walls. He can eat. He asks, hey, you guys got anything to eat? Not that you have to eat, but you can eat. And it says, you know, come fill me. I have flesh. Actually, I was, you wouldn't say flesh and blood. I'd say flesh and bones. He has a physical body. It can appear. It can disappear. It can go through walls. There's no more pain. There's no more, there's no more suffering. There's no more aging. All those things are past. And so you have a glorious body in your future. Verse 50 says, I declare to you, brother, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. And of course, the, the meaning of that word in the Greek is that I'm, I'm telling you a mystery, something you did not know before was not known beforehand. We will not all be asleep, or in other words, we will not all die. But we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothes with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brothers, stand firm, let nothing move you, always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So through that, that chapter, Paul is correcting a false teaching that was going around that, yes, Jesus was raised from the dead, but you won't be. And he makes it clear that, yes, we have a future. We have a body, this physical body that we see grow older, that we see fail us, that we see the aches and pains. We have a new body, a glorious spiritual body. There will be no more pain. There will be no suffering. He will wipe every tear from our eyes. So our future is great. So the fear of death should not be. Be among Christians, because we know, as Paul said earlier, he said, you know, if I had my choice, I'd rather go and be with the Lord now. But if it is better for me to be here, then I will do it. So we need to have that assurance deep in our heart. And it's kind of like Christianity 101, and yet we really don't dwell on it, or we really don't conceive just that glory that is in front of us. I want to give you a couple of other scriptures. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, in verses 13 through 18, it says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who have fallen asleep, or in other words, those who have died, or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep. According to the Lord's own words, 
we tell you that we who are still alive while are left till the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the air to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. So something we are to encourage each other about our future hope. What our future hold, we have a glorious future ahead of us. And I might mention when it says that that we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord. Again, that is that, that Greek word, epantis, A-P-A-N-T-E-S-I-S. It's only used two places, here and then in Acts 28, verse 15. And again, that's where Paul's coming into Rome as a prisoner. The Christians go out from Rome to meet him. They turn around and they go with Paul into Rome. And so it's usually used as a term when a dignitary is coming and people go out to greet that dignitary and then they all turn, they're going the same way. So as we see this picture, we see that we will be caught up with the Lord, but we're coming with his direction back down to planet Earth. Now, you don't have to look this up, but there's a couple of verses I was also thinking of. Luke 23, verse 33 is where Jesus is on the cross. And he tells the thief, he says, Today you shall be with me in paradise. That very day. So the day day that this thief dies on the cross just came to believe in Jesus as he's on the cross. And he says, Today you shall be with me in paradise. And then I think of, you know, Mark 9 where it talks about the, the Mount of Transfiguration where Elijah and Moses appear in their, in their bodies, in their glorified bodies. The disciples see them, you know, Peter, James, and John. And there they are, you know, in the flesh, so to speak, but in spiritual bodies. And all of a sudden, they're able to go, they're able to come. And another one is on, go back to the Gospel of John. I'm going to read this one, 14. In verses 23 to 26, this is after uh, Lazarus had died. Well, let me find it. That's not the one I'm looking at. Got the wrong chapter, but I will find it. The death of Lazarus, okay. Which would be chapter 11. So in verse 23, this is where Martha comes to Jesus after Lazarus had died. And Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. And then Martha answers, now I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? will never die. In other words, we experience, you really don't even have to be sick if your spirit leaves your body, then this earth suit, this thing we call, or, you know, that Paul talks about being a tent, crumbles to the ground, your spirit, soul, that's your spirit and soul, the soul that is your kind of mind, uh, will, and emotions, It goes on for eternity. The things that make you, you, 
as opposed to your neighbor, lives forever. And so when we make that transition from this body, from this physical earthly body that is mortal, that is decaying, that it will at some point fail us, we go into the glory of the Lord. We go into his presence. We have this future hope of this new body that you're going to get, this upgraded body, that again, that will never know sickness, that will never know pain. That will be able to enjoy things and do things. We're going to have, we're going to have responsibilities. We're going to have things to do. But the days are the days of sorrow, and the days of the things that we deal with today in, in this physical body will be no more. And so again, it's, it's kind of Christianity 101, yet it's something that I think we, we very rarely talk about. And I think that's part of the reason why when Rick Joy made that statement, you know, most Christians don't die well is because we don't realize, we don't really have it in our heart what's in store for us. We should fear, never feel de- fear of death. We should be actually looking forward to what our future is. And so I think we all need to be encouraged. And it says, as it said in the scripture, encourage one another each day. Because that is our future. Now for the world, what can you tell them? Eat, drink, and be merry. Because this is good as it gets. And that's sad. I mean, that's, but that's, and that's why I, you know, I can see why so many people try to dull that whether it was alcohol or with drugs, or because there's something out there they know that is waiting. They have, a, they have an inward knowing that this life is ending. And they have no future, which is also why we need to be witnessing. We need to be uh, reaching out to those who do not know the Lord so that they can have that same hope that we have. So again, is it, here we are at this Christmas season. We talk about you know the birth of Jesus, although Michael Heisner says that he was born on uh, September 11th. So whether it was September 11th or whether it was October, doesn't really matter to me. But it's just that we need to celebrate not only his birth, also his death, his resurrection, and also our resurrection. That is our hope. And I'm kind of interested to know what some of you guys will look like in your new bodies. And how cool that may be. Because we will know each other. Because again, that soul, that spirit, that soul, that your mind, will, and emotion that makes you you, <clears throat> that's forever. Except we will be in a glorified body. One that again, never feels pain, it never deteriorates. It's immortal. We have eternity to spend with the Lord, to spend with each other. And it's a glorious future. So we should not grieve as those who are lost. For our loved ones, as long as we know they were in the Lord, they have an incredible future. And kind of it's hard to say sometimes, but, but if it's a loved one and they've gone to be with the Lord and we may be missing them, they're probably really not missing us. I mean, they'll be glad to see us, but they're, have, they've, they've, they're seeing so many things, that unbelievable things, they can't even, you know, fathom from our earthly perspective. The glory that is yet to be revealed to us. So encourage one another with that, that we have eternity. We have a new body, a glorious body in our future. So, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness, Lord, that you have given us this eternal hope that, Lord, this life is just a drop in the bucket. We have eternity, Lord, to spend with you, to spend with others, to spend with loved ones. Lord, to further your kingdom and whatever that looks like, whatever responsibilities we have. But, Lord, We're so grateful, Lord. And Lord, we 
ask that you would help us to keep our mind on things above and not on the earth. Lord, we are so easily distracted by the here and the now, because that's all we know. But Lord, build a faith within us for eternity, for a glorious eternity. And we thank you, Lord, for what you've done on our behalf. We thank you, Lord, that that you were raised from the dead, that our Heavenly Father sent his only begotten Son to die for us, that we might have eternal life. And Lord, we just say thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness, for your goodness, for your kindness, for your love for us, love. For you first loved us. And Lord, teach us to love you more, to grow in our love for you. Lord, we want you to be our magnificent obsession, the desire of our heart, Lord. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.